السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight Inshallah ta'ala I won't be that long However there are some, some things that I, I think that we need to have um, we need to have a we need to have discussion about from time to time i think as as a muslim community we need to have you know heart to heart conversations about difficult things to talk about um alhamdulillah i'm i'm like to think that i'm fortunate enough to be amongst those who don't mind having uncomfortable conversations there are some who avoid you know having those conversations and therefore it creates a void you know creates a, a void of people scratching their head trying to figure out why do we see so much dysfunction and toxicity going on around us in the muslim community and we don't hear muslim imams preachers and teachers you know speaking about and addressing the issues you know as they should be you know uh, we're constantly we have this you know this culture of kind of sweeping everything you know what I mean it's kind of sweeping everything under the prayer rug and we think that by doing that these problems will somehow just disappear and we can kind of just move on and as we sit we just begin to realize that our environments you know within the Muslim community becomes more toxic and more toxic you know and it's only it's only you know, it's only but so much a person can take. Me, I'm one of those people, I have a high sense of justice. I don't like to see people being treated unjustly. I don't like to see injustice. And I mean, we should all feel like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abhors injustice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the hadith al-Qudsi that he has written dhulm, harram dhulm ala nafsi, that Allah has made dhulm, oppression, injustice, you know, forbidden on himself. وَجَعَلْتُهُ بَيْنَكُمْ مُحَرَّمًا And he has made it between us as human beings haram, and, you know, injustice is prohibited. So don't oppress one another, don't be unjust to one another. So there is a natural hatred and abhorrence that we should all have to injustice you know provided some of us are the ones that are doing the injustice so quite naturally if you are in and you are you know you are you know a perpetrator of injustice you know seeing it is not going to really bother you you know what i'm saying when, when you when you're a proponent of it um so i'm going to just kind of lead with a quote and then I'm just going to kind of take the conversation from there, dealing with some of the things that I listed on my post earlier. So I just ask that you guys kind of bear with me. Uh, for those of you on Periscope, for obvious reasons, I have turned the the the, com the, the chatting and the the um, the commenting off for obvious reasons. Uh, once I'm done, inshallah, I'll double back and I will give you guys an opportunity to you know state your piece. Um. But let me just say this before I begin. I, I don't speak or post anything so people can agree with me. I speak my piece and you guys can sort it out. For those of you who are commentators, you like to go on people's Facebook pages and Instagram page and comment and leave these long drawn out comments. Like I leave that to you. I'm not a commentator. I don't comment. I state my piece. I state how I feel. You know, it doesn't mean that it's right. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong either. It's just my take on the world you know what i mean my view on what's in front of me and you can agree with it or disagree with it but i'm not here to disagree with you if you disagree with me <laughs> you know what i mean like those days are over i'm not here to disagree with you if you disagree you say i respectfully disagree or i disagree with you you are totally titled entitled to your opinion absolutely absolutely so let me lead with this quote from a guy by the name of jiddu uh, Krish Namurti, Namur, Namurti. Um, he wrote, he made this quote, you know, in relation to what was going on in the 1950s, uh, looking at America becoming a more fascist society. He said, it is no measure of health 
to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. I have used this quote before and it is so profound. It is no measure of health, meaning you can't sit from a place of privilege watching a sick society go on around you and judge, you know, what I mean, like your health and judge, you know, how good, how better off you are based upon the sick society that you live in. You are a part of that society. You, you are a part of the society. So, uh, you know, as Muslims, we like to sit from a place of privilege and watch all the dysfunction and the toxicity go on, permeate, you know, the Islamic community and then sit from a place of privilege and say, well, that's not really my problem. It's not really my I'm good. And you're not good because you are part of the problem. <laughs> you are part of the problem. It is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. It's like we're okay with the toxicity and all the dysfunction that's going on around us. It's like we're cool with that. And then we get on the minbar for the Muslim leaders and preachers and imams. I'm, I'm, I listen, man, this is no holes barred, man. I ain't sparing nobody. <laughs> nobody gets spared at this, you know, at this point, man, like nobody gets spared, man. And because it's, it's the tiptoeing around and the diplomacy that got us into this mess to begin with. The politics. Oh, you shouldn't have said that. Oh, you should have talked to this one. Or you should have spoke to that man. Miss me with all of that, man. That's the part of the problem. That, that's part of the problem. Sitting around talking about, oh, you should have contacted this brother. Or you should have contacted that. Or you should have spoke about this. Or you shouldn't have said this like this, man. Miss me with all of that. That is part of the problem. That's why we in this mess to begin with. If we had straight shooters and people who spoke it as it is... We wouldn't be having these problems to begin with. But everybody is playing the politics and everybody is so freaking diplomatic. You know what I mean? And it's, and it's crazy. Yes, it has been normalized. It, it, it has been normalized. But you're part of the problem. If you're well adjusted to a profoundly sick society, then you are part of that as well. You just as sick. Don't say uh, I got my thobe on and, you know, I'm Salafi and I'm over here and I'm, I got my thing going on and over here and, you know, the rest of them was like, no, you are part of that. <laughs> How are you separating yourself from that? <laughs> you are part of that. So here we go. There's, there's nothing wrong with Islam. Let me say that. Disclaimer. Let me throw that out there from the very beginning. There's nothing wrong with Islam. But there is something inherently wrong with with those who have put themselves to be the vanguards of Islam when it's convenient for them. It's like people who appropriate black culture. It's like, you know, you want to be, you know, you want to wear the baseball cap and you want to sing the raps when it's convenient for you. But when it's time to protest, it's time to stand in solidarity, you know where to be found. You understand what I'm saying? It's like everybody want to be an imam, preacher, teacher, leader in the Muslim community when it's convenient. But when the fit hit the shan, you know where to be found. I, I mean, I'm just, you know, stop me when I deviate. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm just, I'm just stating, I'm just stating the facts, man. I'm just stating the facts. Everybody want to be a preacher, student of knowledge, teacher when it's convenient, when you can put on a thobe and you can sit behind a chair and you can teach from this book and from that book. Everybody want to be that guy. But when it's time to really get in and start dealing with some of the toxicity and the dysfunction in the Islamic community, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know where to be found. Crickets. We don't hear nothing. We don't hear nothing. I'm, I mean, you know, correct me when I'm when I when I'm wrong. But there's nothing wrong with Islam, but there's something inherently wrong with the with those who have placed themselves in the position of vanguards of Islam, and those who have you know put them put themselves in positions to not only you know teach Islam, but you also have a responsibility to everyone is not a fighter. All right, well, then get out the ring then. Don't put the gloves on. Don't step in the ring. If that ain't your bag, then step out the ring. I, I'm, not, I'm not accepting no excuses at this point. So I'm going to say my piece, as I said, and then I'm going to just let you guys comment. Because, you know, some of you, that's all you're good for is commenting. There's people that's feet that's on the ground, that's putting in the work, that's doing the work every single day. While many of you sit around on social media and you comment, I'm not a commentator.
there is a responsibility that comes along with teaching, right? When you teach Islam, you also have a responsibility to protect the people, you know, from leaving Islam. You, you have that responsibility, we can't see people going in and out of Islam and say, well, that's not my problem. Maybe Allah didn't want guidance for them. No, man, you, you have a responsibility to teach Islam and protect the people that are, you know, ascribing to this religion to protect them from leaving this religion. There was a time when people converted to Islam and, and never left the religion. They didn't leave the religion. If you go back to the conversation between Hiraqal and Abu Sufyan, when he was asking him a whole bunch of questions, right? Hiraqo, he said to Abu Sufyan, he says, Sa'altuka, ayartadda ahadun sakhtatan lidinihi ba'da an dakhla fi. He said, does, I asked you, does any one of these Muslims, do any one of them leave apostate from their religion after... Entering into it, sakhtat and lidini, out of a hatred for the religion. Listen to his question. And if I ask that question today, are there Muslims right now, people right now who convert to Islam and then leave Islam out of a hatred for this religion? Not necessarily for the religion itself, but the way that the religion is propagated, the way that the religion is, is, is spread, the way that the religion is taught. Absolutely. In droves. Absolutely. And do we say, can we sit back now and say that that is as a result of Allah not wanting guidance for them? Or do we take a, a share in that? Do we take part responsibility for that and say, well, you know, maybe we need to take a look at ourselves. Are, are we doing something wrong here? Absolutely. We, got, we have Muslim children born and raised in Islam who want absolutely nothing to do with this religion. Nothing. Not because something is inherently wrong with Islam. So he asked Abu Sufyan, he said, does any one of them, these guys, these Muslims, these followers of Muhammad, does any one of them, yaratadda, andinihi, does any one of them apostate from his religion? Out of a hatred for his religion after he enters into it, he said, for the karata and la, and you told me no. And Hiraqal, who was not a Muslim, he said, For that iman hina you call it hina to call it to bashata to kulub. That is what happens when true faith aligns itself with a pure heart. That is what happens when true faith aligns itself with a pure heart. And true faith obviously is nurtured through information about the religion. How do we nurture Iman except through in, through knowledge? Knowledge is what nurtures and cultivates our faith. And when the faith aligns itself with a pure heart, people don't leave Islam. People don't leave. So, you know, there is a such thing as information overload in the Islamic community. And I, I think at this point, the last thing that we need is a lecture. I, I'm just being honest with you, man. I'm, unless you are a new convert and you have yet to acclimate yourself to Islam, I think that probably the last thing that we need at this point is a lecture. <laughs> uh, I'm just being honest, which is why I don't lecture anymore. You don't see me on Periscope. You don't see me on Facebook Live giving no more lectures. I'm done with that. The last thing that we need at this point is a lecture. There's a such thing as information overload. Uh, and the information is not the problem. It's the practical implementation of the information in a manner that produces healthy results. Right? I, I put a post on Instagram the other day. Shout out to my man, Seth. You know what I mean? No, no disrespect to him, but... I said, you know, you know, what is what is the problem with our dysfunction? And the brother he put, you know, we need more seminars. And I'm like, more seminar? Like, we're not gonna fix this problem with another lecture or seminar. <laughs> we're not gonna fix these problems with lectures. That's that's not gonna fix the problem. As a matter of fact, information overload is what got us into this dysfunction to begin with. And I'm gonna tell you how. <laughs> 
I'm going to tell you how. All right? We are overloading, overloading the Muslim community with information about trivial, sometimes trivial matters of the religion. Information overload. Right? We're bombarding you with new information about the religion. Such intricacies of the religion that, you know what I mean, that just really doesn't, is really not necessary for the average 9 to 5 Muslim. Doesn't need the religion on that level. I think sometimes when students of knowledge leave Medina or leave Egypt or wherever they study from and come back to America, they're still in this mode of thinking that everybody else is like them. The average 9 to 5 everyday working Muslim does not need you know what I mean? The intricacies of the religion on a level that a student of knowledge has learned it. <laughs> but the student of knowledge doesn't figure that out until 20 years later. <laughs> 20 years down the line, he kind of realizes that, you know, you don't know, went through these books back and forth, back and forth. And still there is no practical implementation of all of this information that you are dishing out to the community. It. It, it's 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 unnecessary. It really is. And I think that we create more lectures and more we create work to avoid the real work. I think that we create work to avoid the real work. Just just real talk. I think that we create lectures and that we go into such intricate details of the religion because we can distract you with that because in the in the in reality we really don't have nothing else to offer I, i'm just i'm just speaking facts here stop me when i deviate <laughs> i just think that we create work so we don't have to do the real work it's like a husband at home who always got something to do because he doesn't want to do what he's supposed to be doing as a husband. And that's showing emotional attention to his wife, spending time with his kids. So he creates things to do that is a diversion, diversion, and it's a distraction from the real work of a husband. I'm, I'm just, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just saying it, what it is. And I just think that a lot of students, are not, they don't have nothing else to offer. That's all they have. So when we're done with one book, we jump into another book. And, and meanwhile, the, the whole community is dysfunctional right in front of you. All this dysfunction going on right in front of you. And the next thing that you want to do is jump into another book. <laughs> I'm teaching this class next. Masha Allah, Tabarak Allah. You create work so you can avoid the real work. I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the second set of eyes that was revealed to him, Ya ayyuhal mudathir. Oh, you wrapped in garments, get up and warn. Meaning the work was outside of the house. Get out of the house. Right? Ya ayyuhal muddathir. Kum fa'anvir. Get up. Oh, you wrapped in garments. Get up and go out and warn. Meaning the work was outside of the home. Once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayyuhal muddathir, he became a messenger. He was a prophet with iqra. Iqra, bismi rabbika alladhi khala. When Allah revealed iqra, that he became a prophet. As Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab mentions in his book, Nubbi'a bi iqra, that he became a prophet with iqra. Wa ursila bi muddathir, and he became a messenger with muddathir. Now, if you were sitting in a class with someone who was just reading this from a book, regurgitating to you, he wouldn't even be able to make the connection here. He wouldn't be able to make the connection. And this is part of the, over, the information overload problem is that you're giving out information, but you're not showing people how to make the connection. They're not able to connect the dots. So what is the sense in you teaching class after class after lecture after lecture after lecture and the people that you are teaching and preaching to are not able to make the connections with the information that you've given them? And then we just kind of overloading you with more and more and more and more information. And there's no practical implementation, 
practical imp implementation of the information in a manner that will produce healthy results. Look at how unhealthy our communities are. More speaking African-American Muslim communities. Look at how dysfunctional and unspiritually unhealthy our communities are with all this information that is floating around our communities. Because there's, there's dissemination without practical implementation in a manner that will produce healthy results. Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he said, ما أنت بمحدث قوم حديث لا تبلغه أقولهم إلا كان لبعضهم فتنة. Abd Allah bin Mas'ud, very profound statement. He said that you will not narrate information to a person or to a people that which their intellects cannot conceptualize. Except that that information will be a fitna for some of them. I'll say that again. Follow me. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said that you will not narrate to people information about the religion that their intellects cannot conceptualize. لا تبلغهم أقولهم وتبلغه أقولهم that their intellects cannot even conceptualize they can't even conceptualize what you're saying إلا كان لبعضهم فتنة except that that information is going to be a fitna for some of them we're speaking about all of these huge issues thick issues عقيدة issues deep Issues of the religion, intricacies of the religion to people who are literally functioning with a basic high school education. The average brothers and sisters that are sitting in the messages, sitting, listening to these lectures with all due respect are, I would be exaggerating if I said that their, you know, their level of education exceeds a high school diploma. I, I would be exaggerating that their intellect, their intellectual prowess does not exceed a high school education, which is why when you're done with the lecture, there's a whole group of people waiting to ask you questions about things that you've already discussed. Misinterpreting, misunderstanding, and they walk away believing that they have some grasp, some major aspect of Islam when in fact they are about to go lead somebody astray. They're going to go home, they're going to go to work tomorrow, they're going to tell their Muslim neighbor, yeah, I was sitting in a lecture yesterday and the imam said this and you totally misconstrued the entire concept and you're about to go lead somebody astray. Based upon some intricate matter of the religion that you thought you understood. And here you are functioning with a basic GED, a basic 10th grade education. I, I'm, I'm speaking facts, man. Stop me when I deviate, man. I, I'm, I'm just speaking facts, man. And, and, you know, and we got these grandiose ideas. Of, I'm about to turn my Islamic community into, you know, right? Where are you going, man? Where are you going? Where are you going? I I'm just trying to figure out where are we going with this? Because year after year after year has gone by and we are teaching these books and we're not seeing any results, any healthy results. Any healthy results. We got Muslims pulling out guns on other Muslims, Muslims murdering other Muslims. Muslim children turning to, you know, uh, alternate lifestyles. We're, we're, and meanwhile, we teaching classes every day. <laughs> every day we teaching classes. Like, I mean, like, help me understand this. Am I going crazy? Help me understand this, please. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, he made sure that when he instructed his emissaries, when he dispatched people to go to different places to teach people and call people to Islam. Pay attention to this. Pay attention to this. Because a lot of you listen to me with your own biases. 
You got one foot in the lecture and one foot just waiting for me to say something that you can't conceptualize. And then it's like, all right, what they've been saying about him is correct. You, you listen with your own biases. And that's, and that's very unfortunate. Unfortunate. All right. Nonetheless, because I, I'm going to be honest with you, there's nothing like a street dude that is woke. There is no human being on the face of this earth like a street dude that is woke. They know both sides of the fence, man. And that's exactly what you guys have been, you know, distracted from. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he made sure that when he instructed his emissaries to go teach people about Islam, that they paid attention to their progress before overloading them with more information that was beyond what they could understand. I, I, this is documented information. It's not stuff I'm pulling Yanni and JB. I'm not just pulling this stuff out of my pocket. These are documented hadith, authentic narrations. You understand? The Prophet ﷺ, when he dispatched people to go teach people about Islam, he made sure that when they taught people about Islam, that they paid attention to their progress. And that you don't give them more information until they have... You know, until they have shown some progression in what the little bit of information you've already given them. All right. I'll give you a, a, I'll give you evidence for this. All right. When the Prophet Wasallam sent Mu'adh bin Jabal to Yemen, he said to him, he instructed him before he sent him. He said, in the min ahlil kitab. He said, you are going to a people from the people of the book. You're going to a people from a people of the book, meaning Jews and Christians. Different religion. He said, Fad'uhum ila shahadati an la ilaha illallah wa anni rasulullah. He said, Call them to la ilaha illallah, the concept of monotheism. There is nothing worthy of worship, no deity worthy of worship except Allah. Wa anni rasulullah, and I am the messenger of Allah. He said, Fa'in hum ata'uka li dharika. If they adhere to that, fa'alimhum. He said, if they accept that, meaning the concept of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, if they accept that, they, they, this is talking about progression here, right? Monitor their progression. If they accept that, they're willing to accept that, then teach them that Allah has obligated upon them five prayers throughout the day and night. And for in whom and if they accept that, then teach them that Allah has obligated upon them sadaqah that is taken from the wealthy and given to the poor, meaning zakat. You see the the gradual progression. So what if what is to be understood from this? If they did not grasp the concept of la ilaha illallah, do not move forward. Don't give them any more information. You, you guys follow me. It, it only makes sense. It's logical. It makes sense. So here we are today talking about Jarh wa Ta'deel. We're talking about matters, intricate matters of warning against this one and what scholars say and when you take a scholar statement and when you don't take a scholar. I mean, mind blowing, mind blowing. The subject of jarhwa ta'adil, of criticizing a narrator, this is a subject matter that on the Islamic University, that on that complex, <laughs> the Islamic University, out of the whole entire Islamic University, there's only one college that teaches jarhwa ta'adil for one semester, <laughs> and that is in the College of Hadith. So all of these scholars and these, you know, these, these knowledgeable people of this particular science, I'm trying to figure out where in the world did you learn this science? Because if you didn't study in Islamic University and learn that science from that and you have a degree to prove that you studied it and you passed it, I'm trying to figure out how, number one, where did you learn it? And number two, who qualified you to teach it? 
I'm, I'm, I'm just asking questions. I, I mean, please tell me, where did you learn Jonathan Mutadio? Because as far as my knowledge is concerned, the out of the five colleges on the university campus, only students in the uh, in the College of Hadith have studied that. And uh, most of the brothers that you guys listen to and take information from didn't even graduate from the Islamic University. So I'm really confused. I, I'm really, really confused. <laughs> If you didn't study with a professor under a structured, you know, academic regimen and he has a paper saying that he's qualified based upon, you know, some proficiency in that particular subject matter, who qualifies you to teach this? And, and then furthermore, who in the world said that um, the average American Muslims, nine to five, everyday working Muslims, is, should be taught this type of information. And believe it or not, you have scholars teaching this stuff, doing lectures on this stuff. We're doing telelinks. Like this is this is how crazy, how insane this stuff is. You have students of knowledge who would hook up a telelink in the masjid and have a sheikh give a lecture in Arabic and translate it into the English language to everyday working nine to five Muslims. Who don't even know how to recite Al-Fatiha properly. The Prophet Sallallahu said to Mu'ad. Teach them. The first thing you teach them is. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. For in whom ata'uka li dharika. If they accept. If they obey you in that. Meaning they accept that. Then teach them about Salat. So there was a progression there. Monitoring. The you know. Their, how they were receiving this information. And you have scholars, so-called scholars in Saudi Arabia who will give telelinks and give lectures about such intricacies of Islam, not even monitoring the people that you're talking to, understanding your crowd, understanding the people that you are addressing. You're talking about people who come from single parent homes. You're talking about people who come from broken homes. People who grow up in inner cities like Philadelphia where, I mean, like, kids are being murdered. 13-year-old kids are being murdered. You're talking about a brutal society. And here you are giving lectures about some of the most intricate details of Islam. I mean, is, is that, is, I mean, like, is that fathomable? Would the Prophet ﷺ have even approved? Approved of something like that? I mean, it's, it's shame, mupki. Stuff that will make you cry, man, when you sit back and you reflect on this stuff, man. And then you look at the end result of our communities. Look at the end result. Look at the end result of this overload of information into our communities, man. So, and the thing is, is that many students of knowledge, and rather than focusing on this, are more concerned with finding new, you know, snazzy little concepts to disseminate, which will solidify their distinction as a student of knowledge, rather than concentrating on the basic information of Islam that is already out there. So, you know, there's a plethora of information out there, but no inventory of how that information is being applied and the healthiness of the community with the information before we move on to the next phase. So now you got, you know, Muslim converts who just, you know, came home from jail, you know, can can barely read on a fifth grade level. And he's talking about some intricate matters of the deen and then get mad at you when you tell him, brother, I don't, you know, like you, you talking off the wall over here. I don't, oh, you're going against the scholars. It's like, dude, you got a fifth grade education. What do you mean going against the scholars, man? You could barely read on a fifth grade, a fifth grade level, man. If I put some fifth grade math in front of you, well, lahi, man, you wouldn't know how to answer that. And you sitting here telling me that I'm crazy because I'm not taking what you got to say. Dude, you talking off the wall, man. Then you get an attitude and I'm off it. I'm astray because I don't want to because I can't take you serious because you functioning with a fifth grade education. 
because I don't want to take you serious. <laughs> you you got to be kidding me, man. So you have students of knowledge and, and imams and teachers are looking for new concepts to introduce to the community. Oh, I'm going to do a lecture on this and I'm going to do a lecture on that. You know, looking for ways to solidify your distinction, your misa. You know, you're looking for exclusivity, but you're doing it at the expense of furthering the confusion and the dysfunction of the Islamic community. Trying to stay relevant. <laughs> Trying to solidify your distinction as a student of knowledge. Like, you don't have to do that. Just stick with the basics of Islam. Let's talk about good character. <laughs> talk about good character. How about that? Something very basic. Given the greeting of Salam. Let's talk about that. I mean, some of, some of the brothers don't even know, you know, just the basics of giving the greeting of Salam. Good character. <laughs> Which is my next point. We got the first point. I'm, I'm talking about the things that have contributed to the dysfunction that we are seeing in the Islamic community amongst African-American Muslims. This is what I'm talking about. I, this is what I'm talking about. The second thing, my next point, is if we're suffering from information overload, then that means that our behavior is not changing. The information is not impactful. It's not changing our behavior. It's the same information that was given to the Sahaba. And look exactly, look at what the, that blueprint produced. And then the same information is, you know, flourishing in our communities. But look at what it's producing. What it's producing egotistic, self-aggrandizing, arrogant, egotistical individuals. That's, that's what information in our community is producing. It's not producing humility, compassion, mercy, insight, foresight, leadership. It's not producing any of that. If so, then correct me, please. I, I would love to see where the information is producing this type of atmosphere, this type of environment. If our behavior is not changing, then that means that either the information is not effective or it's not being taught for the purposes of character refinement or we are just inherently rebellious, evil individuals like Beni Israel, who no matter what Musa did um, to point them in the right direction, they always found a way to circumvent being obedient to Allah. And I don't believe that we are just inherently evil and unteachable as Muslims. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I don't believe that we are just inherently evil, unteachable, rebellious Muslims. I don't believe that. Not for one minute. I don't. Number two, I don't believe that the information is ineffective. Which only leaves me with the third point, and that is that the information that is being given to the community is not being given to the community for the purposes of character refinement. The religion of Islam is a religion that puts emphasis on good character. And we see Muslims that are sometimes worse than non-Muslims. Wallah aladheem, when I'm out in public... And the unfortunate thing about me is that sometimes Muslims see me. I don't know who they are. I don't have a clue who they are, but they can see me from a mile away. And, you know, they've already decided how they're going to interact with me, my family, whatever. The, I mean, I see Muslims, they walk right past me. They don't give me the salams, nothing in public. Here I might have a non-Muslim see me. Hey, how you doing? You know, Mr. Muhammad, blah, blah, blah. And then Muslim walk right past you. Don't even give you salams, nothing. <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> The non-Muslims like, isn't that your Muslim brother? It's like, yeah, you know, <laughs> you, you can't explain it. You can't explain it. I mean, like, how do you even put a spin on that? But this, this is, you know, this is what we, this is what we do. Meanwhile, we got all this information floating around in our heads about what the Prophet did and what the Prophet Wasallam said and what the Quran says. We can run it. We can run the whole thing down to you. But the information that we hold was given to us not for the purposes of character reformation. 
It was given to us just as information. That's it. It's just information. Not for the purpose of changing our behavior, refining our character. That, that wasn't what it was given for. And it's not just Salafis. I ain't even just talking about Salafis. I'm talking about Muslims in general. Muslims in general, we have horrible character. Horrible. Online, in public, horrible character. And here, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمِ الْأَخْلَاءِ I have only been sent to perfect moral character. I have only been sent to perfect moral character. And he structured, he phrased his words in a way where it makes it seem as if his only objective as a messenger was to perfect moral character. And we know that his mission, you know, exceeded much more than that. However, he wanted to put emphasis on the importance of good character. The Prophet sallallahu pay attention to this hadith because we, we make a lot of mistakes with this hadith. Pay attention. The Prophet sallallahu he said, مَنْ جَاءَكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ فَزَوِّجُوا That when a man comes to you, a man comes to you and you are pleased with his deen and his character. Notice the distinction between the two. And keep in mind, deen is a part of uh, character is a part of deen, but the Prophet Sallallahu made it clear here to make a distinction between the two. He said, if there comes to you a man who you are pleased with his deen and his character, showing you that deen and character, although one, but they are two distinct elements. Two distinct elements. Deen and character. He said, if a man comes to you and you are pleased with his deen and his character, then marry him. Marry him. So now I, I want you guys to critically think because that is what a teacher does. Forces you to step outside of your comfort zone of just accepting information blindly and forces you to critically analyze the information that is in front of you. Why did he separate the two? What was the hikmah? What was the wisdom behind separating the two? He said, if there comes to you a man who you are pleased with his deen and his character. Character, shaitani. Character, something different from deen. Deen here, the practice, the rituals of Islam. You pray, you fast, you do the rituals. But that does not indicate that you are a good Muslim. And this is where we make our mistake. The Prophet ﷺ, pay attention here. The Prophet ﷺ, he, he separated deen from character, placing emphasis on one's behavior while distinguishing it from the ritualistic practices that doesn't necessarily that don't necessarily define the goodness of a person's character. Just because you pray, you fast, that doesn't mean that you are a good Muslim. You understand? And this will help to explain the mistakes that we make during the premarital process, looking for somebody that prays. In fact, I just want a brother who prays. I want a sister who wears hijab. I want a brother who cover. I want a brother who prays. I want to, you know, I, I had one sister said she wanted to marry a brother who wore thobe. I don't want no brother who wear kufar clothes. That, I, I'm just, you know, one of my eyebrows just goes up like, huh? You don't want a brother who wear kufar clothes. What does that even mean? Please explain that. I'm, I'm interested in understanding what that means. <laughs> and then when you say that, it's like, come on, brother, you know what I'm talking about. Nah, I don't know what you're talking about because you, you want something totally different. I don't know what you're talking about. Don't ever f force me to align myself with your thinking because we come from two different walks of life. I'm sorry. I have no idea what in the world you're talking about. <laughs> What do you mean when you say kufar clothes? I don't want to marry a man who wear kufar clothes. My husband got to wear thobe. I'm like, <laughs> how detached are you from reality? I'm, I'm just really, I'm just really trying to process this. Well, I, I tell you, ask me no questions. I tell you no lies. This real talk, real conversation that I had with a sister who said she did not. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, even if the brother has a good job, is a good husband. 
good father to the children, you still not going to marry him solely based upon how he dresses? So I don't want no brother wearing no kufar clothes around my kids. And I'm just like, wow. I'm like, sis, I can't help you. <laughs> you might want to go somewhere else and find you a husband that don't wear kufar clothes. I don't even know what that means, honestly. I, I don't even know what that means. I mean, don't, don't, you know, don't undermine that because that comes from a mentality. That comes from a mentality. You got to understand the root of that dysfunction. And that's what we're here talking about. We're trying to get to the root of a lot of this dysfunction. You know what I mean? But when we say, oh, that's crazy or she's, she's nuts, blah, 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 blah. That's dismissive because now you can't get to the root of where that stuff comes from. Don't, don't, don't judge her. She, it's not her fault. She didn't become a Muslim and automatically adopt that ideology. That was something that was force fed to her. You understand? That was something that was force fed to her and she accepted it, adopted that ideology for whatever reason. So what I'm trying to help us to do is to get to the root of a lot of this dysfunction and where it comes from. But we're constantly looking for people who pray and fast because we use that as the gauge to discern or to, to, to determine whether or not the person is a good Muslim. And the fact of the matter is that the khuluk, character, is what defines you as being a good Muslim. What is your character like? What is your behavior with the world around you? What is, what is your behavior with the world around you? Anybody can do, even the hypocrites in Medina did the rituals of Islam. To the point where the Prophet Wasallam said that as long as they pray, we consider them a Muslim. That the contract between us and them, meaning as long as they pray, I will treat them as a Muslim. Even though he knew that they were not Muslims. Even though he knew that they were not Muslims. They were clear hypocrites. But he said, as long as they pray, they establish the salat, I will treat them like a Muslim. So just because a person prays and fasts, that doesn't solidify that they are a good Muslim. That doesn't solidify that. What solidifies you being a good Muslim is that you have good character. Your behavior, your character is aligned with the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the believer in his book and what was demonstrated in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I mean, there's, there's no other way to, you know, to, to spell that out. Just because a person prays and fasts, that doesn't make them a good Muslim. That makes you a practicing Muslim. Uh, you are a ritual Muslim. You do the rituals. I get it. <laughs> but then when you get into an argument, you all type of mother effers and you all types of B-I-T-C-H's. Ask, ask the sisters right here that's on here, how many of them have been called a B-I-T-C-H by a man who prays five times a day? Ask how many sisters who have been punched in their face. We're just dealing with a situation of a brother who killed his stepson. Brutally murdered him. And this was a guy who prayed five times a day. Like that doesn't make you. You understand? Your character. Your character. A man who murdered Ali bin Abi Talib. Anhu, was a man who was half of the Quran. Memorized the entire Quran. Umar anhu, sent him to Egypt to go teach the people in Egypt the Quran. And the same man who memorized the entire Quran decapitated Ali bin Abi Talib. Anhu. You understand? This is a Hafid Quran. But the Prophet ﷺ mentioned about them that the Quran would not go past their tongues. It's only on your tongue. How many brothers who, you know, lead the salat in the masjid? Man, I know situations where a brother done pulled the gun out on another brother in the masjid over who's going to lead each other in the salat. <laughs> you, you understand? This happened in Baltimore. <laughs> Baltimore, Maryland. Dudes getting ready, getting the shootout in the masjid over who's going to lead who in the salat. I know another situation similar to that that happened in New York years ago. Where brother pistol whipped another brother in the masjid over who was going to lead the salat. You understand? Facts. I'm not telling you no lies. Those who know, know. 
Those who know, know. Pistol whip a brother in the masjid. Because they got into an argument over who's going to lead the salah. You understand? That's, that's the mentality that I'm talking about. Information overload with no practical implementation whatsoever. The Prophet Sallallahu said that whoever comes to you and you're pleased with his deen and his character, then marry him. Not just because he prays. Not just because he fasts on Mondays and Thursdays. Good for you. Kudos. Good for you. You fast, mashallah. You pray, mashallah. But that's not enough for me. Your character. I need a character reference. Who can reference your character? Who is a, you know, a person, a reputable person that can, you know, that can vouch for your character. And for those of you who are on Facebook Live, the camera goes the opposite way. So this looks like my left hand to you. This is my right hand. For the umpteenth time, I am right-handed. <laughs> I am right-handed. <laughs> so drinking with my right is natural. That means that I have to consciously make a decision to drink with my left hand. I actually have to think about it to drink with my left hand. Drinking with my right hand is naturally because I'm right-handed. I don't even have to think about it. And just so you always know, I always wear my watch on my left hand. I never wear my watch on my right hand. All right? So please stop with the, oh, he's drinking with his left hand. Even if I drank with my left hand out of a by mistake, would that invalidate everything that I'm saying? <laughs> Here again, the biases. You guys listen with a bias. So you look for any little mistake to say, see, oh, he's drinking with his left hand. MashaAllah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just saying that for the disclaimer, because I know there's about to be a comment. Oh, he's drinking with his left hand. Okay, cool. Anyway, moving right along. But you guys understand the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he separated deen from character. <laughs> you understand? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Mam is shayin yuva'u. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said talking about the good character talking about good character which we, we kind of like just kind of dismiss as if it's something that is not Important. He said, there is nothing. Mamin shaitan. There is nothing. Nothing. That can be placed in the scale of the believer on the day of judgment. That will be heavier in his scales than good character. Nothing. There is nothing. There is nothing. That would be heavier in the scales of the believer on the day of judgment than good character. Good character. He said, and indeed the person in the sahib khuluq al-hasan, indeed the person with good character can reach the level because of his good character of someone who stands all night to pray and fast all day. Me here again, the rituals. That the person that has good character, through his good character, can reach the same levels of the person who fasts and prays. Because they're just doing rituals. But you can exceed them. You can supersede them with your good character. Because it's heavier in the scale. Meanwhile, good character, you know, is nothing of no consequence in our communities. We don't care what your character is. <laughs> we want to know how much you know about the dean. If you can spit out some phrases, some words, and it sounds like you're intelligent, sounds like you got the deen under control, mashallah. In our eyes, you are raised in extra status. However, the person over here with good character, you know what I mean? Like, they're nothing in our eyes. He said, well, indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inna Allah la yubghid. 
Al-Fahish Al-Badi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates the Fahish, the indignant and the imprudent. So this whole idea of using profanity and speaking to people in disrespectful ways and calling people out of their names and you a deviant and you this and you're that and you're astray. And like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates you. He hates that behavior. I shouldn't say he hates you, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates that behavior. Inna Allah la yubghidh. Al-Fahish Al-Badi. Allah hates, he abhors imprudence and disrespect and indignant behavior. And we see it every day. More so when we interact with Muslims than anybody else. And we'll, you know, use a distraction. As the brother said, we'll say, you know, good character. That's the behavior of Ahlu Bid'ah. That's a distraction. And I'm going to get to that. That's a distraction. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates imprudence and indignant behavior. And we got a ton of it. Sister can have hijab on, niqab on. She'll call you all types of mother effers and call you all out your name. And I mean, like, literally. Literally. <laughs> literally. With, with no, no care or concern, put the, flip the niqab back down and walk on about her business like she ain't do nothing wrong. MashaAllah. Meanwhile, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates you. And this also, this bad behavior is also included in the way that we teach Islam. We teach Islam without consideration for the human elements that, that are natural. When people teach Islam, when imams, preachers, teachers, imams, students of knowledge, a lot of times when they teach Islam, they teach Islam without even factoring in some of the things that make us human. They don't even consider that. It's like anybody who differs with this, they're straight, they're kafir. Meanwhile, you sitting there digesting all of this like, oh, well, if he differs in this and he doesn't do this, this, he's this, he's that. It's like you're not even factoring in that we're human beings. Like we're not robots. And to believe it or not, let me, let me just make this connection real quick. It almost seems like and I'm speaking specifically to those who ascribe to the more hardcore extreme Salafi approach. It almost seems like if you pay attention to how they function with normal Muslims, they function with normal Muslims like the police officers do with regular citizens. It's like they've been given a script to follow and they don't break that script. They don't even see you as a human being. They don't even see you as human being. Police officer, they don't even see you as a human being. They have in their mind a script that they have been fed, that they have been fed, and they follow that script. It's just like, you know, the cop pull you over and say, like, well, where are you on your way to? I'm going home. Yeah, where, where's your home? Where do you live? It's like, why are you asking me questions about where I like? Just write the ticket, man. I, you ain't got to get into my personal life, man. Stop asking me questions about my personal life. Because that's the script that they have been following. Dude, you pulled me over for a broken tail light. Write the damn ticket and let me go on my, my way. Don't keep asking me quite where I live and who's home with my kids and all this other stuff. Yeah, you understand what I'm saying? It's because they follow a script. They don't use any common sense. No common sense. So you'll find some of the extreme Salafis. They approach regular Muslims, normal Muslims, just like that. It's like they have a script in their mind. Oh, he doesn't look like this. He doesn't dress like this. She doesn't look like this. She doesn't. So automatically they compartmentalize you. They put you in this box of someone who is not necessarily a Muslim. And the way that they interact with you is almost like you're a kafir, like you're a disbeliever. You understand? It's, it's exactly like that. And let's take it a step further. Let's get to the root of that. And the root of that has to do with the way that Islam is teaching is being taught to them the way that islam is being taught to them with no consideration for the elements that make us human the elements that make us human for example let's talk about differing and having a different opinion and god forbid you have a mind of your own and you can think for yourself and you don't agree with what you hear 
You know what I mean? You are not even allowed. You're not even allowed to even have an opinion when you come across them. It's like, no, you, you're, you're going to accept my opinion or I'm going to look at you and treat you as if you're not even a Muslim. And it's not just extreme Salafis. It's extreme in any sect, in, in any particular approach to Islam. Because I've run into Sufis who've done the same thing to me. You don't agree. They, you know, test you. How, what do you think about this sheikh or this scholar or whatever the case may be? And then they clocked you. They, they've already categorized you and they deal with you based upon what the script tells them how they should deal with people who they categorize as such. So when we talk about differing views, viewpoints, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَجَعْنَ النَّاسِ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا That if Allah had so willed, He could have made all of mankind one. That means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want me to be you or you to be me. If two people are the same, one of you is irrelevant. Allah didn't want you to be me and me to think and see the world exactly the way you think and see the world. Allah says, If Allah had willed, He could have made mankind one nation. That's it. No differing, no different of opinion, no nothing. We would have just been all one people seeing the world the exact same way. Right? He said, And mankind will never cease to be differing with one another except those whom Allah have mercy. There's a small fraction, small group of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation that see eye to eye. But the vast majority don't see eye to eye. They have different viewpoints, different views of the world, different approaches to the world, different approaches to religion. You understand? Allah said if he wanted to, he could have made us all one. Thinking the same, walking the same, viewing the world the same, but he didn't. And he said that mankind will never cease to differ with one another except the small group whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy upon. However, in the Muslim community, you are not allowed to be an individual. You got to align yourself with somebody else's thinking in order to be accepted. In order to be accepted by this group or that group or this group or that group, you got to align yourself with somebody's thinking. You're not allowed to think for yourself. You're not allowed to say to someone, you know, just to be normal and just say, I don't agree with you. I don't agree with that. You know? Imam al-Shafi, rahimahullah ta'ala, there's examples where, you know, scholars of the past differed with each other and they never resorted to the type of things that we resort to when we differ with you. Today in the Islamic community, when, some, when you differ with somebody, it's almost like you're, you're asking for a fight. It's almost like it gets physical. It could get hostile between you and the person simply because you don't necessarily agree with them. We see it all the time on social media and some people use the opportunity to, you know, that I don't agree with you to be disrespectful for you to you because disagreement automatically equates or equals disrespect. Because I don't agree with you, that gives me the right to disrespect you. You understand? It's the same thing that happened in marriages. Not every disagreement has to turn into an argument. That's your, we had two different experiences in the same incident. You see it one way, I see it another way. I don't agree the way you see it. You don't agree with the way I see it. Okay, cool. Why can't we still be husband and wife? Why do we have to run in the room and slam doors and, you know, it, because I, I don't agree with you. I got to agree with you. I'm not entitled to have my own, you know, experience. <laughs> Even if we saw the same thing, experienced the same thing, I'm not allowed to have my own take on that. And men and women, we process things differently. But every disagreement doesn't have to be an argument. It's not an argument. I just don't agree with you. So, Imam al-Shafi, one time he, he differed with one of his students, Yunus, a Safdi, a Sufdi. Uh, he differed with him, Abu Musa. And he, after they differed on an issue... 
Um, Abu, Imam Shafi'i came to him and he said, Ya Abu Musa, and he grabbed him by his hand and he said, Ala yastiqimu an nakuna ikhwanan wa in lam natafiq fi mas'ala. He said, Isn't it more suitable, isn't it more appropriate that we remain brothers even though we disagree in a mas'ala, in an issue? Isn't it more important that, you know, we remain brothers even though that we disagree in an issue? Imam Shafi'i grabbed him by his hand. In today's time, you can't even do that to a Muslim. You can't even say, brother, you know, I disagree with you on that. Without him taking offense to it. Without him feeling like his whole world just comes shattering down because, you you know, you differed with him or disagreed. And we'll use, oh, he was disrespectful. He wasn't disrespectful to you, man. He told you simply he don't agree with you. But because we have this idea that my opinion, the way my approach is just emphatically right. That you don't have a right to disagree with me. I'm coming with the sunnah. You're coming with one aspect of the sunnah, brother. You're not coming with all of the sunnah. I'm glad you think so highly of yourself. Kudos. But you're not coming with all of the sunnah. Perhaps there's leave a little room for error. Just please, a little bit of room. There was an incident that, that happened at Masjid Taqwa. And I, and I told Brother Ali... Um, that when the time came that, you know, I would put the information out there and they got to deal with it as it is. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I'm not just kind of throwing those. Don't say, oh, you should have talked to them before you did that. Man, miss me with all of that. I, first of all, I'm a grown man. I don't need to talk to nobody before I put nothing on the table. I don't need to talk to anybody. Once the information is out there, you deal with it. It's out there. Deal with it. But I told Brother Ali... And I'm sure that these, they're going to get the message. I'm sure somebody texting him right now, letting them know. I don't care. And I told Brother Ali when I spoke to him on the phone that there will come a day where I will address this. And you got to deal with the backlash that come along with that. But I was in Masjid Taqwa some months ago at a, you know, at a nikah that happened. Young sister, my wife knew, was getting married there. And uh, I had absolutely no intention on speaking. I just sat. Just because my wife was cool with the sister and we wanted to, uh, you know, do pay our respects to the young girl to, you know, watch her, you know, go through her marriage process. So, you know, everybody's on the Musalla floor. Salafis there too as well. Yes, absolutely. Salafis is there intermingling right there on the top Musalla floor, right? All right. For all the Salafis that don't intermingle and don't attend the masjids of the deviants, right? That That's the ironic thing. Like... The masjid is a deviant masjid. The imam is a deviant, but when there's a special occasion, I'll make an exception for that. MashaAllah. What, what type of flip-flopping, what type of wishy-washy Islam is this? Please tell me. Iyakum wa talawin fi deen. Fa inna deen Allahi wahid. As one of the scholars said in the past, woe be to you and this colorism that you have in the deen. One minute you this way, next minute you this way, whenever it's convenient for you. Don't play around with the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The religion of Allah is one. Be one way. If that's who you are and that's what you profess, then be that. Don't change that because the, situa the situation suits you or it's convenient for you. That's not salafia. If the masjid is a deviant masjid, if the imam is a deviant, then proceed accordingly, according to what the script tells you. Nonetheless, um, the assistant imam, he gave, uh, he was marrying the sister to the young brother. And, um, you know, and, you know, the way that he handled the situation, I felt like there were some aspects of the sunnah that was left out. You know, he asked the wali instead of asking the young man. Uh, he asked the young man instead of asking the wali, did you did you pay the dowry? Yeah. He asked the young sister, are you cool with the marriage? She said, yeah. He said, y'all marry. And then he looked over in the corner and he saw me sitting there and he said, you know, brother Shadi, can you come and give a few words? And I, and I said, no, I, I'm not here for that. I didn't come to give no talk. I just came to pay my respects. He's like, no, no, no. You have people of knowledge. Please come say something or whatever. So I come and I grab the microphone. And I said that I just want to kind of re rewind this process. You know, I want to go back a couple of steps. I think there, there was a few things that was missed. I said, I think that what should have happened is that the imam should have asked the young, the, the wali to ask the young boy to ask the wali 
if he would accept his daughter's hand in marriage. That puts the sense of responsibility on the young man. You don't just ask the young man, you know, are you, did you pay the dowry? Ask the woman, are you cool with the marriage? And y'all married. No, 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 no. We, we need to teach our young men responsibility and let them feel the weight of the responsibility. We are giving you one of our daughters. So I said, we're going to do this again. I said, young man, you are going to look in the face of this girl's father and you're going to ask her father's hand for marriage. I want you to feel, and I made him uncomfortable purposely. I want you to feel the weight of the responsibility that is on you. Look in this man's face and ask him for his daughter's hand in marriage. And then the wali is going to look you in your face and tell you whether or not he's giving you his daughter. And then we'll ask the girl if she's okay with marrying him. And that's how the situation is going to go. That's all I said. And lo and behold, they go to Selafis and their claws out and their hatred and their jealousy. Right? So what did they do? Oh, he's disrespecting the imam. I mean, how was that disrespect? I, I don't see where the disrespect was. Period. Oh, that was disrespect. You shouldn't have did it like that. Blah, 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 blah. Even afterwards, I heard some whispering here and there. I went to the imam. I went to Uthman and I said, you know, if I offended you, I'm sorry. I didn't intend to uh, offend you. I didn't. Please forgive me. And it seemed like everything was cool. The very next day, which was a Saturday, for those of you who rock with me like that, you can go to my YouTube page, look under the lecture, Restoring the Autonomy of the Muslim Woman. That was the lecture that I gave that Saturday. When you look at the Periscope, when you look at the video, at the very beginning of the video, Uthman, was, who's the assistant imam, was standing there. You can hear me on the video telling him again for the second time in front of the whole community that I apologize for last night. I'm sorry. I love you. I didn't mean to offend anything. I did everything in my power to apologize. It was, it was sincerely not a slight. I didn't intend. Even if it came off like that, I didn't intend. And no matter what I said to this man... He still had in his mind that he was going to do whatever he was going to do. And guess what they did? Didn't contact Shadid Muhammad. Didn't say nothing. I mean, out of all of the years that I've been going there, my relationship with Imam Siraj, everything. None of that meant anything. None of it meant anything. Two weeks later, after I left, two weeks later, uh, my wife gets a text message after Jumwa. Oh, I'm sorry to hear your husband can't come to Masjid Taqwa and give lectures anymore. Huh? Yeah, they made an announcement after Jumwa. They made an announcement after Jumwa that I could not, could no longer welcome to come to Masjid Taqwa and give a lecture. And I'm like, really? I jumped on the phone. I called Imam Siraj. He didn't answer. I called uh, Uthman. Uthman answered only because he didn't recognize it was my number. So he answered. And I said, Sheikh, I said, Sanaikum. I said, did I not apologize to you in front of the whole community? He said, yeah, but brother Imam, you know, some people felt like, I said, no, 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 no. I said, don't tell me what other people felt. What did you feel? Did you feel I disrespected you? I said, I apologize to you. How many times did I have to say? I said, I apologize to you in front of the whole community. Twice. And I told you I loved you and I, I, I never meant to hurt you. Nothing. I said, and that still wasn't good enough for you. He was like, oh, but, you know, some people felt this way. I said, no, nah, don't tell me what other people felt. Tell me how you felt. I said, and furthermore, you wait until after Jumwa and you make an announcement to the community and you never called me and said nothing to me about it. That's, that's how we do things. That's how imams function. That's how we do things. MashaAllah. I said, I hope, my last words to him was, I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is as merciful to you as you were to me. Salaam alaikum. And I hung the phone up. That's how that conversation went. Then I picked up the phone and I called Brother Ali. Because he don't get off the hook with this either. I called Brother Ali. And I said, Brother Ali, please tell me that, you know, you didn't have anything to do with this. He was like, well, you know, Brother Shadid, I wasn't, you know, totally cool with the situation. I'm like, you wasn't totally cool with the situation, but you ain't do nothing to thwart. You ain't do nothing to stop the situation. Are you serious? You're going to play both sides of the fence? 
I said, you didn't call me. You didn't tell him to hold off on that decision until you spoke with Imam Siraj. I didn't even speak with the Imam. That was a decision that y'all made. You never contacted me. You never contacted Imam Siraj. Nothing. You allowed the Salafi brothers, Mahmoud, and the rest of the Salafi brothers who saw the opportunity to say, see, don't invite him back to your masjid anymore because he's disrespectful to the administration. How in the world is that disrespectful to the administration? But that's where we are. That's where we are. That's how we function as imams. That's how we function. <laughs> so, I mean, it is what it is. But you don't have a right to have a, your own opinion. You don't have a right to disagree with the way that somebody handled the situation. And even when and it's like everything is inverted, it's like right is wrong and wrong is right. Everything is inverted. And the Prophet wasallam, he prophesied that there would come a time where we would live in an inverted society. Everything is inverted. Everything inverted. Right is wrong and wrong is right. Even when you try to correct something and you do it according to the sunnah, you're still wrong. But you got the Salafis in the back. Oh, he's disrespecting the. There's nobody who has been more disrespectful to the administration, the imam, the masjid, masjid taqwa in Brooklyn, New York. There has been nobody that has been more disrespectful to the, uh, to the administration and to the imam and to the community there than the Salafis. And yet you still take the advice from them not to invite me. I mean, I don't, it doesn't make me any one way or another. I mean, so it wasn't like you, you weren't paying me to come to the masjid. Anything that I did there, I did, you know, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you decided to close that door, that's totally up to you. I, I mean, I keep, keep it moving. My world don't stop. You understand what I'm saying? Like that doesn't, I'm not sitting here grieving because I can't come to your message. You understand what I'm saying? Like I was doing that out of the kindness of my heart and you know, my wife's love for the community, you know, encouraging me to come to the community to try to, you know, bring some information to the community. But if that's the way you choose to run your community, I'm totally cool with that, man. It's all good, man. But the point that I'm making is that there's no room for, for differing. You know what I mean? Like you you go you you don't agree with me, that means you are against me. And there was no disrespect involved. Wallahi, I apologize to that man in front of the community. I apologize to that man alone in the room by I, I'm not the one to be disrespectful. That's that's not my character. That's not my character. And if you point it out to me, I'm gonna come to you and I'm gonna apologize to you like a man. That's just who I am. That's, that's just who I am. I'm, I'm not built like that. So go and tell the community and Mr. Takwa that this is how it went down. And this is why. Don't keep saying when brothers asking, well, why should ain't been up here to give lectures or whatever? Tell them the real story. Tell them exactly what really happened. Stop dancing around the issue. You was man enough to make the pull the trigger to make the call? Then be man enough to explain to the community what really happened. And the thing is, is that I, I'm silent until it's necessary for me to speak. So I allow people to draw their own conclusions and say whatever they need to say. That stuff doesn't bother me, man. I don't lose no sleep over that. I don't lose sleep over that because I'm not here to entertain you. I'm not here to meet your expectations. So you can believe whatever you want to believe. But when it's time for me to speak, I'm going to let everything out. I'm going to point out the elephant in the middle of the room, the pink polka dot elephant in the middle of the room, and then you got to deal with that. And you deal with that. Now you go and do your Facebook Live as you've been doing and escalate this where I got to go and expose some more details. Don't, don't escalate it, man. Take it on the chin. It is what it is. This is what happened. I ain't leave nothing out. I left no detail out. Anyway, um, so with Islamic teaching, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he taught Islam to his companions, there was an element of mercy and compassion that was infused in his teaching. You know what I mean? Like, we're not always going to agree, right? We're not going to always agree. But there's a level of mercy and compassion that was infused into the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's teaching. There's a human element to disagreeing and not seeing eye to eye. But today, disagreement is viewed as disrespect. And the degree of intolerance, the degree of intolerance in our interaction with one another is, is really is a matter of how Islam is being taught to us. All right. And this intolerance that is infused into the way that Islam is being taught today, it creates hostility between Muslims. 
It creates hostility between Muslims and animosity between Muslims, which could possibly lead to violence. Which could possibly lead to violent situations, man. When you're telling people, you know, you know, we don't sit with the people of deviance and we don't sit with the people of bid'ah and we frown on the people of bid'ah and Imam Ahmed said blah, blah, blah. And you're mentioning all of these individual isolated situations that narrations that might be authentic, might not be authentic. But the fact of the matter is that when we are giving these this these narrations out, are we weighing that against what the Prophet Sallallahu did? We don't take a situation where Imam Ahmed interacted with this person of innovation like this. And then you now that becomes the sunnah. That does not become the sunnah. We take the statement of Imam Ahmed or the behavior of, you know, Ishaq or Fulan or Fulan, Hassan al-Basri or this one or that one. And we weigh it against what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. We don't take what one of the Salaf did as an isolated situation and turn that into deen. That's not the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Malik said, Whatever was not a part of the religion on the day that the ayat, this day I have perfected for you your deen, on the day that that ayat was revealed, will never be a part of the religion. You don't take an isolated situation from one of the salaf and turn that into deen. And that's the way that these guys have been able to function for so long. They have created another religion. They have created another religion. And if you guys can't see that right now, I'm sorry. I see it for what it is. They have created an entirely different religion other than the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Taking isolated situations from narrations from the salaf and using that as an individual isolated situation to create a pattern of behavior that is hostile and that is aggressive towards other Muslims. I don't know how else to spell it out for you. Almost like the nation of Islam. I'm just being honest with you. Almost like the nation of Islam. So when they're saying, oh, this person's a deviant, don't listen to this one. That's a smoke screen. That's a distraction. They are the deviants. That's a distraction. Why can't y'all see that? That is a distraction. The biggest distraction and you can't see that these individuals are not practicing Islam. That's a completely different religion. What they're on is to something totally different. They have taken isolated. Oh, Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said this and Fulan said this. Now we weigh all of that, filter all of that through the Quran and the Sunnah. You understand? Filter all of that. Through the Quran and the Sunnah. Yeah, Imam Ahmed did this to this person or didn't want to sit with that person. But what did the Prophet ﷺ do in that situation? See, you got to understand how this stuff works, man. They even fuse their teachings with hatred and animosity and it creates violence. It creates a violent, hostile environment. An insensitivity where a person can die as Mufti Munir, his nephew was murdered. And this, he said he went to the janazah. He went to the janazah and there were brothers at the janazah. Wallah al wouldn't even give him the salams. Still wouldn't even shake his hand. Even at a janazah. Something as sensitive as you losing your 13 year old nephew to murder, gun violence. And you go into the janazah vulnerable as you can be. And brother's still holding on to this here again, like the police. They follow that script. They don't let that script go. I can see you out of Janazah. I still ain't giving you the salams. You still a deviant in my eyes. I still ain't make, I still make dua that Allah break your back. You understand? That joint is a whole nother religion. That is a completely different religion. That is not the Quran and the Sunnah that has been left to us by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wallah ala How you come to a janazah where a guy is grieving over the murder, brutal murder of his nephew, and you still won't even get a man to salams. You still won't even talk to him, even in a vulnerable situation like dealing with death, because they don't see you as a human being. They don't see you as a Muslim. You understand? They don't see you as a Muslim. Understanding what you're dealing with. 
When the nation of Islam cut Malcolm off, his blood became halal. They didn't even see him as being a part of them anymore because they were on something totally different. You understand? We're not going to have too many more opportunities to sit here and, and spell all of this stuff out. You guys got to be quick. To, you got to be understanding what's in front of you, man. You got to see what's going on in front of you, man. And this intolerance, man, this in passive aggressive behavior where you're standing in a crowd of brothers and a brother walk up, give this brother salam, 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 and don't give you the salam. This passive aggressive behavior. This is passive aggressive behavior where you walk up to you standing in a crowd of people and he'll give everybody the salams in the crowd except you. Passive aggressive behavior, this hostile attitude, almost as if you want to harm me, you want to do something physical to me. We're talking about Muslims who don't mind spilling the blood of another Muslim because they criticize your imam. They use words like attacking the Salafis. Listen to the language. Attacks the Salafis. Listen to the language. Understand how this stuff works. Understand where this stuff is going. Understand. So this intolerance, you know, is compromising the essence of our brotherhood in Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Al-Mu'min al-ladhi yukhalitu al-nas wa yasbira ala adahum khayru min al-Muslim mu'min al-ladhi la yukhalitu al-nas wa la yasbira ala adahum The believer who mingles with people and is patient with the harm that he receives from them is better than the believer who does not mix with people and is not patient with the harm that he receives from them. There, there, there's a level of tolerance there in dealing with people from different walks of life, the human need for compassion with errors. This is another area where we have become very insensitized, very desensitized, all right? And insensitive. You know, there are many examples of the Prophet Wasallam leading with compassion, leading with compassion. I remember, you know, uh, one, of, one of my professors in the university, Sheikh Ibrahim Ruhali, he wrote a book, you know, encouraging the youth of, of the Salafis to, you know, to be gentle with one another. And literally, we had scholars that were refuting, warning against the book. Rifqan Ahlus Sunnah. You know, Ahlus Sunnah, be, be gentle with Ahlus Sunnah. He wrote a book telling the, the Muslims that ascribe to the, the Salafi Dawah, to, you know, the, the Sunnah, to be gentle with one another. And you had scholars who went behind warning against people who, you know, spread in the book. The person who translated it, the person who spread it. <laughs> how, how do you do that? How do you do that? Because you, you understand what's happening. They want to see us feuding with one another, fighting with one another, keeping us distracted and dysfunctional. Understand how that works. Distracted and dysfunctional. Why would a scholar... Write a refutation on another scholar who wrote a book telling Muslim youth to be gentle with one another. Why? Why would you do that? Yes, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin's book. And then Sheikh Ibrahim Rahali wrote another book, a small treatise that I translated myself. Why would a scholar go behind another scholar who wrote a book telling Ahl Sunnah to be gentle with one another? And this is one of the senior scholars in Medina, who many of these scholars that they take from, they were his students. And he writes a book, a small treatise, Telling people, you know, be gentle with one another. Ahlul Sunnah, be gentle with one another. And then you'll have a scholar that comes behind him and says, anybody who passed out that book, translate that book. They're deviants. They're this. They're that. Stay away from them. They're Ahlul Bidah. Like, how? <laughs> how? Except that you want to see us few and in fighting and acting like Negroes. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> We want to see you acting like Negroes. We want to see y'all doing what y'all do best as African Americans. Do what y'all do best. <laughs> Kill each other. Do what y'all do best. Because that's what we're known for. Savages. 
right? You're savages anyway. Kill each other. Do what y'all do best. And here we are today doing what we do best. Hating one another, hostile to one another, arrogant and aggressive towards one another, doing what we do best, acting like a bunch of Negroes, doing exactly what we do best. Yeah. Absolutely. Because they, they don't respect us. Because why else would you warn against a book that is teaching Muslim youth to be gentle with one another? Why, why else would you warn against that other than the fact that you don't want any good to be spread to them out of hopes that they would not act like Negroes? They would actually act dignified and have some sense, right? I mean, that's, that's the only reason that I could think of that's the only reason that I could think of that a person would, you know, at the time it looked like you were only warning against it because it seems like maybe you were, you know, I got it. My phone is getting ready to die. So you guys on Facebook live, be patient. All right. I'm going to do my best here. I mean, that's that's the only reason that I can think of, you know, because there was nothing wrong with the book. Sheikh Abdul Mursan is regarded in Saudi Arabia as one of the senior scholars in Saudi Arabia. Why would you double back behind him warning against the book, warning against anybody who spread the book, warning against anybody who had anything to do with the book? And then you got these guys, you got Salafis here in the States. They see you with the book on your bookshelf. Oh, you know what the Sheikh said about, you know. I mean, it's like, you got to be kidding me, man. But wanting to see us do what we do best. I mean, you know, I don't have to. I've already stated on multiple occasions how I feel about the whole situation. So, I mean, I, don't, I mean, like, what's like, as the Arabs say, al ma'ruf la yu'arraf. That something that is known doesn't have to be spoken out loud. When you know it, it is what it is, man. All right, but... In ending, man, I, I got to get ready to go, man. There's so many other things, man, that I, I, I wanted to talk about, man. But this whole idea of, you know, leading with compassion, you know, we have to learn how to lead with compassion. The Prophet Sallallahu had a tolerance for mistakes. And this was the last, you know, the thing that I wanted to mention to a lot of you brothers and sisters, man, when you're online and you're dealing with people on social media, man, you got to you got to learn how to be more compassionate, man, with people, man. A lot of you guys rush to judgment. I seen a pay. I seen a post on my page yesterday that I had to delete. You know, regarding, you know, Abu Isa and the murder of his son and the sister was like, I blame the mother. It's like, how dare you? How dare you? How could you be that insensitive during a time like this? You sitting from the comfort of your own home behind a computer talking about who you blame and who you don't blame. How dare you? Where does this where do we get this insensitivity from? That you can sit back on your phone from a place of privilege and talk about who you hold responsible and who's accountable for, you know, the murder of a child. That's, this is not the time or the place to address that. This is not the time for that. This is not the time to address who's accountable, who's not accountable. I'm sure the parents of that young boy will, you know, will, the grief of those parents will eat them away. Nobody has to hold them accountable. They're going to hold themselves accountable. But we sitting here talking about, you know, I blame the mother. You know, why would, you know, she keep a man around her son? That's it. Like, you don't know any of the details. None of the details that have to do with that situation. Yet you sitting here commenting from a place of privilege. You have got to be kidding me, man. Can we possibly be any more insensitive? Any more insensitive than that? You sitting here talking about who you hold responsible, who's accountable in your eyes. You got to be kidding me, man. There's somebody sitting here grieving over the loss of their child. Yo, on social media, man, like Muslims, man, we need to be more aware of our insensitivities towards, you know, issues that are consuming the souls and spirits of individuals, man, in our communities, man. It's not fair. It's not right, man. 
It's not right. It's not right. The Prophet Sallallahu led with love and compassion. Even when somebody committed a blatant mistake right in front of him, he saw the mistake right in front of him, he led with compassion. He led with mercy. You understand? He led with compassion. He led with mercy. When the guy came to him and he said, Ya Rasulullah, halaktu, I've destroyed myself. He's already grief stricken. He's already grief stricken. There's no need to rub salt in an open wound. He said, Ya Rasulullah, halaktu, I've destroyed myself. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam trying to calm him down, de-escalate the anxiety. He said, What is it that is that serious that has destroyed you? And he said, I had sexual relations with my wife during the day in Ramadan. The Prophet Sallallahu didn't say anything about the infraction. He led with what would help him get out of that state that he was in. He said, can you feed a poor person? Can you free a slave? You know, trying to help him get out of that state of anxiety that he's in, leading with compassion. Abdullah ibn Mas'ur radiallahu anhu, he said that, أَنَّ رَجُلًا أَصَابَ مِنْ امْرَأَةٍ قُبْلَةٍ that a man kissed a woman. He kissed a woman. Right? He had a desire. He saw the woman. He kissed her. And then he went to the Prophet. He felt bad. He went to the Prophet ﷺ and told him about it. Guess what the Prophet said? Did the Prophet say, you're a fasic? You're a disbeliever? You need to fear Allah? He didn't leave with none of that. He left with, he led with compassion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayat, in the hasanat yudhibna sayyat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayat, established the salat during the day, parts of the day and parts of the night. Indeed, good deeds wipe away bad deeds. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said to the man, this ayat, and the man said, Ali hada ya Rasulullah, is that ayat just for me? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, uh, qala li jameer ummati kullahum. He said, no, this ayat is for my whole entire ummah, all of them. Not just for you, for everybody. Meaning, you pray. So your prayer wiped away the sin. It's a done deal, man. Don't beat yourself up over about it. And another hadith on the authority of, of Ennis, that a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi He said, I did something that deserves the capital punishment in Islam. The hadith doesn't mention what he did. He just said that I did something horrible. I did something wrong. I did something horribly wrong, O Messenger of Allah, and I deserve to be punished. وَحَضْرَةِ الصَّلَاةِ فَصَلَّ مَعَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ And there was time for salat. So the Prophet ignored him and they established the salat. After the salat was over, the Prophet ﷺ turned to the man. The man said, O Messenger of Allah, I did something horrible. I need to be punished for it. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, هَلْ حَضْرَةِ الصَّلَاةِ مَعْنَا Did you pray with us? The man said, yes. The Prophet ﷺ said, قَدْ غُفِرَ لَكَ You've forgiven. You prayed. Call us. It's over. Stop beating yourself up over it. It's over. That's leading with compassion, helping people to navigate their anxiety. You understand? Helping them to navigate their anxiety, navigate whatever it is they're going through and whatever they're suffering from. That's the Prophet Sallallahu teaching, infusing mercy and compassion and understanding that there's some human elements to us. We're not robots. We're, we're not robots. We're humans. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to differ. There's, there's, there has to be room for that human element, man. And, you know, I, what I see in our teaching of Islam is that, you know, this whole self-righteous attitude where we believe that we're better than this one, we're better than that one. These are the things that are contributing to our dysfunction. This clicking, you know, the, the Muslims, they click up. They go into different cliques. We like to talk about, you know, the brotherhood and sisterhood. But, I mean, that's a farce, man. You walk into a masjid, you got a group of sisters over here and this click and this group, group of brothers over here and this group and this click. And the sisters are just, they're, they're worse. They're worse with it. The niqabis and hijabis are over here and the sisters who not covered properly, they somehow despised and frowned upon and looked down upon. I mean, damn it, she's at the masjid. <laughs> she's there. <laughs> she could be out in the streets doing something else. She's here at the masjid. You, you gonna, you're going to chide her and you're going to, you know, you're going to give her a bunch of dirty looks to make her feel unwelcome and uncomfortable. She's here at the masjid. What, what else do you want? You have her here. Why not say a kind word to her? Why not invite her somewhere? Why not make her feel more comfortable so that perhaps she can keep coming? Perhaps she can put on the hijab like you. Perhaps she can get to a level like you. 
But it's almost like we don't want that. It's like we secretly don't want people to excel. It's like banks. We go, you go in for a loan. They won't give you a loan because you never had a loan. You don't have no bank history. You know, so it's like you won't give me no credit because I ain't got no credit. But I can't establish any credit because you won't give me no credit. We go into the masjid. It's like I don't know you. You're not a part of my clique. Okay, but I'm trying to become part of the masjid, a part of the community. But you won't welcome me in. It's like what else am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to go outside of the masjid and go become righteous and then come back? It's just backwards. <laughs> I mean, like, I don't understand that logic. Please help me to understand. I'm supposed to go home, go out somewhere, go become righteous, put on hijab, and then somehow find my way back to the masjid. And then you'll welcome me with open arms? And then you'll welcome me with open, and even then, you still gotta check my Akita, you gotta check who my take from, who my shakes are, God forbid you listen to Shadi Muhammad, you know, you're like, <laughs> you're still not good enough, it's still not good enough. This is the dysfunction that has us in the space where we are right now. This is, this is the dysfunction, man. And it's sad, it really is, man. Because we have taken something that was designed to make us such better people and we have taken it and we have become worse worse sad man it really is it almost reminds me of an ayah where Allah says Walo shitna la kum biha, that if we willed we could have raised you with the revelation that we gave you but you held on to the earth and you followed your desires. We don't want guidance. We want the culture of Islam minus the spirituality. We don't want that component. We want to look, dress, talk like Muslims, but we don't want to behave like Muslims. We don't want to worship like Muslims, serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, serve humanity. We want to pick and choose who we give. Like, how do you say I'm not going to this masjid because it's a masjid of deviants? <laughs> it's a masjid that is astray. <laughs> well, how in the world is the masjid supposed to be upon something that is correct? Genius, if you don't go teach them. And then you condemn anybody else that goes there. Oh, he, he goes to the masjid of the people of deviants. It's almost like, here again, you want us to be dysfunctional. You want us to be dysfunctional. It's like, here you have a masjid that you claim is a masjid of deviance, right? You won't go to the masjid and teach there because they are upon deviance. <laughs> so it's like, they're supposed to go find guidance first, find the sunnah, find salafiyah first, and then invite you back. Okay. Let me know when that happens. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to make sense out of a lot of this stuff, man. Because it just, like when you sit back and you replay it in your head, you realize how insane the, these thought processes, these philosophies, you realize how, ins how insane this stuff is. So here is a masjid that you consider to be a masjid that is upon deviance for whatever reasons. They have their reasons. But you won't go teach at that masjid so that they can be upon what is correct. I'm not going there because that's not a Salafi masjid. Okay, cool. So then someone else decides to muster up the courage and go to the masjid. And then we condemn him. Oh, he goes to the masjid of the people of deviance. It's like, my goodness, are you serious? It's all a distraction. Understand, it's all a distraction. To keep you distracted, to keep you off balance, to keep you with this dysfunctional approach to Islam, we will never get better. We will never prosper as an ummah until we cut this diseased part of our body. I know the Prophet Wasallam said that the Muslims are like one body, but sometimes you got to carve out that little piece that is diseased of the body. So that it does not infect the rest of the body. That's just how it works. And uh, you know what I mean? Like the sad thing about it is that these individuals are still a factor. No matter how much we try to forget them. No matter how much I try to ignore them. No matter how much I try to act like they don't exist. Still a factor. 
right after this lecture. There'll be people coming to my Facebook page, leaving nasty comments, disrespectful comments. I'll post this on YouTube. They'll go to my YouTube page and they'll leave nasty, disrespectful comments, almost like I'm not even a Muslim. Now, I can't even say a Muslim because you wouldn't even talk to a non-Muslim like that. Here again, almost like it's a whole nother religion. You know, and you got to understand, man, that this way that Islam is being taught, infused with hostility and animosity and hatred, this stuff has the potential to lead to, you know, very aggressive and hostile behavior towards one another. And I mean, we, most of us are only one foot away from Jahiliya and all it takes is the right situation to make us, you know, resort back to behavior that, you know, is not too far away from us. Understand what is happening. It's almost like it's designed for us to, even in Islam, to still act like Negroes. When do we refine our character and dignify ourselves using what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left us? To become better, to want better. When, when does that happen? I, I'm, I'm waiting for it. And that will only happen when Islam is being propagated like that. So, you know, I'll stop there, man. I, I just want, and let me just end with this last point. When you look at the Meccan and Medina period, the Meccan and Medina period, right? There were certain things that were revealed in Medina that was not revealed in Mecca. Because in the Medina period, that was social building. That was the building of a community, building of families. So there were ayats and, you know, narrations that, you know, centered around the laws and guidelines of community, there was a sense of checks and balances. All of the ayats that deal with the, you know, the cutting off the hand of the thief, stoning the adulterer, all of those laws. There was checks and balances. And there's no checks and balances in the Islamic community today. A Muslim can rape and molest his stepdaughter, can molest his own damn daughter, and nobody says anything about it. Not one khutbah, not one lecture, not nothing. No rallying, no going in front of the masjid to decide that this is it. Nothing is business as usual. We keep moving like nothing ever happened. And I'm sick of this stuff, man. Either you part of the solution or you part of the problem. How is a Muslim child, 13 years old, gunned down in the streets of Philadelphia, and the next Friday the khutbah is about salat? About dhikr, the dhikr of Allah. You gotta be kidding me, man. I mean, is, is this contrived? I mean, are, are we doing this purposely? Or is this, there's a, a, a level, a degree of ignorance there and detachment. Tomorrow is Jumu'ah. We just had a young Muslim boy that was murdered by a stepfather. Look and see how many khutbas tomorrow will be about the murder of Muslim children in the city of Philadelphia. Look and see how many khutbas. Maybe they'll do it now because I'm saying something. And alhamdulillah, if that's the case, then Allahu Akbar, the goal was achieved. But let's see how many khutbas tomorrow will be about, you know, protecting our children. These children are vulnerable in these homes. You sisters, wallah al need to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and pay attention to your damn children. Stop inviting men into your homes, inviting men into your lives, taking advantage of your damn children, man. Gotta be kidding me, man. Being married can't be that serious. That you would sacrifice the life of your children just to have a man who doesn't even respect you. You've got to be kidding me, man. Are we that desperate? Has the desperation reached that level where we would sacrifice our own damn children just to be in a dysfunctional relationship? You have got to be kidding me, man. Not one of mine. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, man. We got to do better than this, man. We have to do better than this. This is ridiculous, man. How many incidents, how many more children, Muslim children need to be molested? How many more children need to be raped? How many more Muslim children need to be killed? Before we decide, okay, enough is enough. Where are the checks and balances? Who do we hold accountable, man? Who's accountable? You can't tell me blood and emotions are being spilt over into the Muslim community and nobody is responsible. Nobody is accountable for that. I'm sorry. That's not the religion of Islam. In Islam, there is a system of checks and balances. 
I'm sorry, this is not our religion. This is not what the Prophet ﷺ left us upon. You can't possibly tell me that, you know, our children are being, ch Muslim children committing suicide. You never hear anything else about it. Tucked under the rug, swept under the rug, under the guise, oh, I don't want to expose this one, I don't want to expose this one. But then you go expose dumb stuff about people that don't need to be exposed. That's the ironic thing. Just a complete oxymoron. We go and we expose people's business on social media that really could have remained private. And then we want to be silent and private about stuff that really need to be exposed. Where's the images and the pictures of these men that are raping the women? That should be floated around the community. I don't want to expose the brother. Then when the hell are we supposed to hold people accountable if you don't want to expose him? How has that become the justification for our dysfunction? I don't want to expose him. Sister called the message, you need marital counseling, but you don't want to expose your husband. Then go back to the same dysfunctional environment that you came from. How the hell am I supposed to help you when you don't want to tell me who it is so we can confront the individual? I mean, listen, if you guys are cool with that, I'm good with it. I'm only here to state the facts. I'm only here to just, you know, call out the elephant in the room, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you guys are just going to sit back and just allow this stuff to happen to our children and nobody says anything about it. Like, I mean, I hold the Muslim leaders accountable. How you an imam, a student of knowledge, a leader in the Muslim community and all of this function is going on or dysfunction is going on in the community and you don't say anything. I'm sorry. I lost a lot of respect for a lot of brothers, man. Students of knowledge, imams, preachers, and teachers, man, I lost a lot of respect for you dudes. I, I can't align myself with people who sit and watch injustice take place and say absolutely nothing about it. I'm sorry, I'm not cut from that cloth, man. I'm not cut from that. When, when do we say enough is enough? How many more of our children need to be molested? How many more Muslim children need to come out and say, I was touched inappropriately, I was molested, I was raped, before we decide, okay, enough is enough? How many more Muslim children need to be murdered before we start holding people accountable? How is a Muslim child shot in the chest, shot in the head, and we just pray to Janaza and move on like nothing ever happened? Nobody's accountable? Blood is all over our hands and nobody's accountable. You got to be kidding me, man. We live in America where there's a system of checks and balances, man. You got to be kidding me, man. Muslim kid is dead. We pray Janaza over a Muslim child and nobody's responsible. Nobody's accountable. Okay, the guy who did it in jail. But where did the mentality come from that it was okay to do that? Where did the mentality come from? Where did the teaching originate from that that behavior was acceptable, that that was okay? Where did that come from? I'm sorry, that's not the dean of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I personally, I ain't doing no GoFundMes. I ain't getting on no lives. Put me in jail right along next to the side of the dude. I, I handle my business. I'm sorry, it's not, I'm sorry, nah man, nah, it, there's a system of checks and balances in Islam. And I'm not advocating somebody go out and do something, I'm saying we need to organize as a community, create an SOP, standard operation, standard you know, operating procedures in our communities that when this happens, this is the action that we take, legally. The police are involved. You murdered my son. I'm, I'm, I'm suing you. A civil suit. The damage that you, psychological damage that you've caused me and my family. You don't get to go to jail, get three hots in a cot, spend the rest of your life behind bars in a freaking day room, smoking cigarettes, watching videos all damn life for the rest of your life and playing chess. Meanwhile, I'm sitting out here, the mother of my kids sitting out here grieving. You, no, you don't get to do that. No, on taxpayer dollars, on my dollars. So I'm, I'm paying for your three hots in the cot after you just murdered my kid. Hell no. Gotta be kidding me, man. You have got to be kidding me.
Do you mean to tell me all this, all this stuff is going on in our communities and nobody's accountable? Muslim children are molested. Guy disappears and that's it. Nobody's accountable. Muslims then had guns pulled on them. Nobody's accountable. You didn't call the cops. We still functioning with the no snitching. Pull the gun out on me. You got two options. Either you're going to use that or I'm going to shove that joint down your freaking throat. You got to be kidding me, man. And you pull a gun out on somebody and then walk away like, like everything is cool. Like, what? In what world? In what world? I mean, it's, it's, it's just ridiculous, man. It's ridiculous. And the time has come where, you know, I'm appealing to those of us who can actually see what's going on here. That if we do not create communities that has a zero tolerance... For these types of behaviors, they will continue. If you haven't checked lately, America is probably the most dysfunctional society in the world. And it is not getting any better. It's not getting any better. And if the Muslim community does not unite and put their resources together to create a safe environment for our children, we will not have another generation of Islam. We will not have another generation of Islam. Our masajid are already hostage, held hostage by imams and you know board members who really could give a damn they just want the bureaucracy of the masjid to continue they want the money to keep coming in out as it relates to the social services and the services the needs of the community they can give a damn about it the masajid are not our safe spaces much of our dysfunction has started from the masajid Muslim professionals need to get up off of your behinds and get involved. You don't need an imam's permission. You hold a degree, you hold a certification in counseling, a, you know, a clinician. You don't need an imam's permission to get involved. You don't need the masjid's permission to get involved. Your qualifications is the single most qualification you need to get involved. And your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your desire to see people do, do better. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, other than that, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. So, I mean, I don't really have a lot of time for questions, man, to be honest with you. It's almost 11 o'clock. Uh, I held you guys long enough. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, brings peace to the faith. The families, man, that are suffering, the families that are dealing with children who have been raped and molested by, you know, sick individuals in our communities that we keep harboring. We're harboring fugitives, people who need to go to jail, and we're harboring them in the community. You know where a brother is, and you know that he's responsible for doing some stuff to doing, you know, some deviant behavior with a child, with a minor and you know where he is and you don't say nothing, you just as responsible. You just as responsible. You harboring fugitives, man. We know brothers in the community and we got to release this, this, you know, this, uh, you know, this boys club mentality that, you know, I'm just trying to protect the brother. Nah, you hurting the brother. Because what you're going to end up doing is not saying anything and you're going to move on to another community and do it to somebody else. That's the bottom line. How many more of our children need to be hurt? And then what, what are we bringing to the table in terms of healing? What are we doing in terms of bringing healing to the table so that the Muslims who have been suffering from that? You know, Sister Sharia, I mean, shout out, man. Mashallah, she's, you know, created an organization to deal with children who have been molested. Get behind some of these organizations. If you ain't man enough, you ain't woman enough to step up and let your voice be heard, then at least use your money, man. Fund some of these organizations. Fund some of these. You have Sister Jessica, Jessica Cares. You have Sister Sharia, you know, dealing with, you know, children who suffer from trauma due to, you know, molestation. Like, you got so many different programs out here. Get behind some of these programs, these organizations, man. If you're not man enough or woman enough to at least stand up and say something about it, then at least allow your money to 
fund organizations that will provide a platform for people to say something about it. At very least. The Prophet Sallallahu did say that. You see a wrong, you change it with your hands. If you can't change it with your hands, then you change it with your tongue. If you can't change it with your tongue, then at least hate it in your heart. Allow your heart, the hatred that's in your heart for what's going on to, you know, push you to go use your money, use your finances to go fund an organization or, you know, people who are dedicated to try to help eradicate a lot of this dysfunction from our communities. And stop sitting back from a place of privilege, criticizing everybody because you can't see yourself being in the position that they're in. We stop looking at your success as my failure. We're some jealous crab in a barrel type of dudes and women. Sad, man. You don't want to do the work, and then when you see somebody else doing the work, you want to sit back and criticize. Sad, man. Are we letting all of our Negro out, man? We letting all of our Negro out in a religion that was supposed to help us eradicate a lot of this Negro behavior that we brought with us to Islam. And we letting it all out in the religion. Sad, man. It really is, man. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring peace and, and solace and, and tranquility to the hearts and the families that are suffering. I, 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 and I mean like, I mean that with the utmost sincerity, man. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to heal as a community, to heal and grow as a community, leading with compassion and mercy. I, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to wake up out of, out of this sleeping state that we've been in. And, you know, go get our children and bring them back to Islam. Bring them back to our, bring them back to where they belong in this deen. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I pray that you brothers and sisters stop sharing information, videos and information of people who you know have contributed to our dysfunction. Stop sharing that crap. Stop sharing the information. Because you're looking at one isolated statement from this brother or that brother. But then when you look at the whole picture and see that this person has been responsible for a lot of our dysfunction, freak this isolated comment that seemed like it's, it's a good comment or good statement. You're helping to promote the dysfunction. Helping to promote the dysfunction. And at very least, man, start critically analyzing what's happening in front of you. And don't be afraid to call a wrong a wrong. If it's wrong, say it's wrong. Sister, you know the sister is working on her seventh, eighth marriage. And then we see her, mashallah, she's intended. I ain't no mashallah. Nigga, you've been married ten times. The hell you mean, mashallah? Because he or she is intended now. But you've been married ten times. There's something inherently wrong with that. But we're looking at the fact, oh, she's intended or he's intended. Masha Allah. May Allah put barakah. Man, please. May Allah put barakah in what? You've been married 10 times. What the, what the hell you mean? May Allah put barakah in it. I, I don't understand that thought process. You sitting right here. You know the person is intended. You know this person. This is their seventh marriage. Their eighth marriage. Eight times you got it wrong? Come on, man. And you gonna sit here and say, MashaAllah, may Allah put barakah in your marriage. How deluded are you, man? How detached are you? Why not say, I hope this, you know, let me give you some woman to woman advice. This your seventh marriage? This your eighth marriage, brother? Let me give you some man to man advice. Because while everybody else may be happy at the fact that you intended, I'm sorry, I'm disappointed that you're intended. Because this is your seventh marriage, your eighth marriage. You understand? No, I'm not happy for you and I'm not hating on you. I'm just calling it as it is, man. I'm sorry, I can't be happy for you. I was happy for you your first three marriages. Every single time you come to me and tell me you intended again, I'm supposed to say, Masha Allah, every single time and never call you out on your bull crap? No, nah, man. No. Nah. The Prophet ﷺ didn't do that. When Fatima bin Tuqais came to him and said, Muawiyah proposed to me, Abu, uh, uh, Muawiyah proposed to me, Abu Jahan proposed to me, he said, don't marry, Abu, uh, don't marry Muawiyah, he's poor, he has no money, don't marry Abu Jahan, he beats his wife. Don't marry either one of them. Very clear about that. And this is, unfortunately, today, we're so wrapped up in, uh, you know, being diplomatic and being political, we don't even know how to tell a brother to his face or a sister to his face, you dead wrong. 
Those type of individuals don't even exist amongst us no more, except a small few. But we sit there and placate everybody's feelings. Sister, take off your hijab, put on makeup. We put in comments underneath. Oh, mashallah, you're so beautiful. You're so this, you're so... Man, knock it off. You're so disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're such an embarrassment because you're better than this. Stop placating people's feelings, telling them they look beautiful when you're sitting here immersed in disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La wallahi, I'm not cosigning that. Then when you don't cosign, it's like, oh, you hating. Nah, I'm not hating, man. No, nah, matter of fact, I am hating for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Absolutely, I'm hating. Yeah, I'm hating. For the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I hate your behavior. I hate your behavior. I hate the way that you display yourself all over social media like this. Absolutely, I'm hating. Call me what you want. But don't call me a placator of your feelings because I'm not placating your feelings, man. I'm going to tell you exactly like it is. Everybody else might be happy for you. I'm sorry, I ain't happy for you. I'm not. And let me be entitled to that. I'm entitled to my feelings. These are my feelings. I'm entitled to that. Don't take that away from me. Don't take that away from me. I'm entitled to my feelings. I'm not proud of you. I'm not happy for you. I'm sorry. I'm not. It is what it is. You got to live with that. Sit in your discomfort. So I'm, I'm going to leave on that note. Because if I keep going, I'm going to keep going until, <laughs> until Fudger. So I have to go. I pray that the information, inshallah ta'ala, resonates. I pray that those of you who are woke, this only you know, increases your wokeness. And for those of you who are still asleep, I pray at some point you wake up. I pray at some point that, you know, your eyes open and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow you to see reality as it is instead of how you wish it should be. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all for our sins and our shortcomings. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, during this night of Jumu'ah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our dua. Please keep those of our community members that are suffering, that are hurting, that are grieving, that are going through whatever it is they're going through right now. Please keep them in your dua. It's Jumu'ah, the night of Jumu'ah. The, the night is, is, is Mubarak, is, is blessed, is, there's Barakah in it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all for your patience, for listening. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to, you know, worship him and continue on in our you know, service of him and our service of his creation. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam al-taslim al-kathira. Wa subhanaka rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.